Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, and welcome to the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy uh, here at the University of Michigan. Before I introduce uh, our guest uh, and speaker for today, I just want to say a quick thanks to the communications department, uh, Cliff Martin, who re recently brought a new life into the world, which to some extent is the reason why we have talks like this to celebrate and understand what happens to life in this world when they come and when they go. So a shout out to Cliff Martin, who's not here, uh, without whom this talk wouldn't be what it will be today. I want to thank Laura Lee, Aaron Flores, uh, Nick Faust, Thomas Cook, Chris Myers, uh, all from different parts of the Ford School. And then Carl Cole will be walking around taking photographs for part of it, or sitting down taking photographs for part of it, who I recently met at the Secretary of State taking photographs. <laughs> he followed me there. I was like, why are you following me here? Um, he said, no, the Ford School's got him covered in faculty uh, at the Secretary of State. Now, that was supposed to be a joke. <laughs> I agree with you. It wasn't funny. Uh, those of you know me, it's not my strongest suit is to be funny. I'm normally pretty serious. Uh, that's why my students, some of them at least call me Yazirius. <laughs> um, so, Dr. Um, Professor Harden, I've known for over a decade and met in South Africa on a wilderness program with um, young and older men talking about and engaging some of the more difficult issues that face our society, uh, both especially at the edges of our society. And this was shortly after the apartheid government in South Africa had been removed and Dr. Harden at the time and several others from different parts of the United States uh, were visiting South Africa in order to see what type of lessons, what type of support networks we could establish in terms of understanding some of the very difficult intellectual issues that face us as intellectuals. So it's been a conversation for over a decade. It's the first time that I've managed to bring you to the University of Michigan, so thank you for accepting. Uh, Dr. Hadden, uh, Professor, my bad. Uh, Hadden, I met you before you became uh, <laughs> an man. Um, has 25 years of experience in serving serving and consulting uh, in social services and in community settings. Dr. Aden currently serves as the director for Northeastern Illinois University's Master of Social Work program. He specializes in trauma uh, and trauma work, both traditional um, and non-traditional interventions within community settings. He's uh, worked as a clinician, administrator, educator, and intellectual, and advocate, an, adv ad an activist I, won. I nearly thought I'd invent a new word, an advocist, but I don't think that exists um, yet. A uh, community practitioner in the USA and many parts of the world. He has served as a consultant with a range of institutions, the city of Chicago, Chicago Public Schools, the Illinois Department of Human Services, and the Illinois African American Coalition for Prevention. Uh, his research and work currently as a principal, co-principal investigator with the Paul's University's multi-faith multi veteran support project, an initiative in the state of Illinois to build capacity in support of veteran communities and their families. Now before I welcome Dr. Hedden to the table, I want to say two more things. The first thing is another thanks to Dean Collins, uh, who has worked hard to make spaces available for us here at the Ford School to, at the Ford School to speak about some of the difficult issues that will be the subject uh, of the talk today. I also want to add that in 
engaging with these issues at institutions of higher learning, whether it be in the United States or elsewhere, is an important task, in my opinion, not only for those of us who identify and recognize ourselves as intellectuals, uh, but also those of us who identify and recognize ourselves as willing and prepared to lead in the process of holding such hard uh, conversations and dialogues in society. Uh, and I want to thank you for coming, and I want to acknowledge many of, the, of you in the room whom I know in multi multiple capacities at the Ford School as being prepared to take up and to put in the time and effort that it requires when we have this type of privilege to sit in a classroom or in an auditorium to engage with these issues. So I want to thank you for taking the time out of your very he heavy schedules and your busy days uh, at the end of the semester to engage with what uh, Professor Hoden has to say, and I'm going to call him Troy now because that's how I got to know him pre some of these institutional badges that and hats that we sometimes wear as a human being and as a person who comes from uh, Chicago and who cares about some of these issues that will be the intellectual subject matter of his talk beyond its intellectual paradigm to include also his life and his cares and concerns which he has carried with him for, and this is based on many of our conversations, for most probably most of his life. So thank you very much for accepting our invitation. I'd like to welcome you to the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. I think it's the first time I've said it so many times in one hour. Um, but that is my responsibility, so I will say it. Um, please, without any more of my words, please join us and be welcomed by some amazing minds and hearts that, I, that exist in this particular building. Okay. On time, check, you let me know what time. Good afternoon, or oh, early evening. Uh, thank you all, thank you, thank you. Uh, uh, first, I just wanna uh, say thank you to Professor Henry, uh, uh, who I now know as Yazirius, right? That you all gave me. Uh, uh, just for really opening up the space and inviting me here, uh, it's really a treat. Um, as um, Professor Henry mentioned, um, I had the opportunity to meet him in South Africa, uh, engaging in some difficult dialogue, if you will. And I was struck uh, by um, his seriousness and his intensity and his intellectual mind, uh, but more importantly, by his heart um, and by his passion and his compassion. And um, I view him as a mentor, a peer, a friend, uh, in an ongoing struggle and as a comrade, an ongoing struggle to combine the two, you know, that of sound mind and analysis along with uh, a caring heart towards these things that are happening out here in our community. So thank you uh, for the invitation. Um, and also to the Gerald R. Ford School of Public Policy. It's truly an honor and a privilege to be here as well. Uh, just thinking I uh, could be at the Woodrow Wilson School talking about these issues, right? And it'd be a completely different conversation, correct? You know, So I'm really glad to be here today and engaging in this um, at this uh, distinguished institutions. So whenever I start um, any conversation, I uh, always first like to just throw thanks to those who come before me, uh, my ancestors, my mother, Bertha Hardin, father, Brady Hardin, who instilled in me uh, the desire and curiosity and thirst for knowledge, but then also uh, the, the idea of being a king with a common touch, understanding what it meant to be able to have some form of analysis, but also uh, uh, connect with what's happening on the ground. Um, as well as those who come before me who you don't see behind me, uh, a community and a wealth of people who uh, support me. Um, and um, as uh, Yazir shared, um, I 
really try to engage in these ideas um, in part because they're very personal for me um, as an educator and also as an administrator in, in higher education. Um, I believe that in education we create transformational spaces and uh, much like what I try to do in the trauma working community um, uh, here, uh, these things can happen in very profound ways. Um, but I'm also really privileged to have uh, an eight-year-old and a four-year-old. I got an eight-year-old daughter and a four-year-old son, and they help me and constantly remind me of how to keep that transformational space going in a home. And so uh, just Saturday, I had a conversation with my daughter, and uh, well, we were actually at a family function, and we were getting ready to leave, and one of the family members asked, what are you guys getting ready to do? And I said, we're getting ready to go see a movie. And so they turned their attention to my children and asked, well, what movie are you guys going to see? And they said, we're going to see Zootopia, right? And I don't know if anybody's heard about the movie Zootopia. It's a really you know, cool movie that's out theaters, and we hadn't seen it yet. And so uh, one of the family members asked my daughter, what's the movie about? And my daughter responded, um, well, Claire said that one of the characters is racist, right? And I'm like, whoa, right? Because we hadn't talked about the movie, and of course Claire said what Claire said, right? You know, it's been an ongoing theme in our household, right? Um, and I'm sure at Claire's household is what Sanaya says, my daughter. So um, I was interested to see everybody's reaction because we were all shocked. I hadn't heard my daughter use the term before. And so I was curious as to what she's going to say. So of course they asked her, you know, well, what, is, what does that mean? What, is, what, what does racism mean? What does racist mean? And she paused and stopped. And well, I'm, I'm on pins and needles, like, what, what, what does she have to say out of her mouth? And she says, um, well, I'm not real sure. But I heard somebody say that Donald Trump was racist. And so I'm thinking it's not such a good thing, right? You know. <laughs> so, um, I was like, well, she didn't hear that from me, but ultimately, uh, I thought that was interesting uh, in, in posing. It's out of mouth of babes. But um, what uh, I'm bringing that up and bringing all that conversation is to say that whenever we talk about race, whenever we have this discourse and dialogue, um, it, depending on who's in the room and how things are happening and how the conversation is happening, um, it can go a lot of different ways. And so the invitation here is that as we begin to have and, and have this discussion and talk about this uh, and have this conversation, is that um, we look at it as challenge, but also an opening to conversation and an ongoing conversation that we have to have in this country. In particular, when we bring in the spectrum of violence, it becomes very critical as well. Um, so I want to start here with um, this young man. Uh, his name is Demarius Reed. Um, I received a phone call. Uh, in 2013. Um, uh, it was actually approximately a month before my last time that I was up in this area. And the phone call was from one of my former students who uh, asked me had I heard the news. And uh, you know Demarius is the son of one of my former students, also a colleague and someone who is a very dear friend, Carl Reed. And uh, they had said that Demarius had been killed. Demarius, who some of you may remember, uh, was an Eastern Michigan University student, football player, and was killed in a robbery attempt um, at his apartment in Ypsilanti, uh, right outside the university. And naturally, uh, uh, needless to say, we were all heartbroken. Uh, and of course, my attention at that moment turned to Carl and his wife and figuring out ways that we could support them. Um, about a month later, I ran into a colleague from Eastern Michigan University in the Department of Social Work who invited us up to engage the university in a larger conversation around trauma and community violence. And we came up, and so that's what I was saying. That was the last time I was here. And so one of the things that was on our minds while we were here was uh, what was the response to Demarius' death, right? It was getting a lot of national attention. Uh, it hit ESPN because Demarius was the athlete, but it was also really big news in Chicago, and I know it was part of the news cycle up in this area as well. Well, um, at the time, they hadn't found Demarius's killers, um, and uh, maybe about two months later, uh, they finally caught up with him and arrested him and, and began the process of having a trial. But I really want to bring up a statement that I heard one of the detectives say at the trial. 
Um, and that was that he didn't believe they would have done the due diligence and the work to capture the killers. As a matter of fact, he stated, he said, we didn't put much of an effort in it until we found out how big a celebrity he was, right? Until the media attention was garnered on, on this particular case. And um, so, of course, that was heartbreaking. But the other part of it is, and this is where I go to in this issue, is, uh, is really thinking about the value of black life, right? That without the specter of the camera, without the media gaze, um, Demarius killers would have been found. As a matter of fact, I would argue that even the attention, the news cycle about his death would have been marginalized and, and probably put to the wayside. And even as we engage in this critical conversation around race and violence at this time in our country, and particularly trauma, I also think about Laquan McDonald and the Michael Browns uh, and the Eric Garners of the world, and even the Tamir Rices, uh, that again, without the specter of media attention, these lives might have gone on uh, without people paying a lot of attention to it and without uh, a due diligence and a conversation around the value of black life. So it's here that I want to problematize and look at this issue in a very uh, clear, nuanced way uh, to bring up that it's not an either or in our community, whereas that we focus on one hand on the police brutality or we focus on the homicides and even the uh, interpersonal violence that we see, it's a both and. And so that's the specter of the conversation that I want to have here today is in that both and, and then how do we, within this moment, uh, in this place and time, begin the process of thinking about how we address those issues, uh, particularly in a policy and even in a human rights framework. Um, so, so as an interventionist at heart, um, I design, uh, I research, design, plan, evaluate different types of programs, I consult uh, as I just said, with different uh, people, both in public and private world, around a lot of these different programs that we see out here, um, I think it's critical that we bring this rights lens to that conversation uh, and talk about that. So I wanted to spend a few minutes talking about some of the work that we've done uh, in Chicago to give you a little context and background. Um, I like to do that um, and then you know, bring in some of these, uh, this other part of this conversation when we talk about this idea of social trauma uh, and, and then talk about some of our work that we're doing, um, if that's okay. Uh, so this is an intervention that um, we designed uh, a few years ago. It's called Full Circle, and Full Circle was designed for uh, young men, uh, primarily young men on the west side of Chicago. If you know anything about Chicago, uh, um, uh, the African American community is largely situated on the south and the west side of the city. Uh, people are dispersed in different parts of the city, but uh, the, the largest uh, group, the largest uh, population of African Americans exists in these rims. Anybody in Chicago, from Chicago in the house? Got a few Chicago folks? Excellent, excellent, excellent. Thank you for my home team being here, right? Um, so uh, on the west side, uh, there's a street organization called the Vice Lords. Many of the young men uh, who were a part of our particular uh, group, uh, were a part of, of that street organization. Not all of them, but many of them were. And so our job uh, was simply to construct an anti-violence effort in that community by engaging these young people. So we did a host of different interventions uh, in supporting these young men um, around you know, moving through some of the tougher issues in their life to a different place. You can see me somewhere in that picture trying to be hard, right? Um, but that's uh, what we did. And the billboard, um, uh, so we did a lot of things. We did a lot of group work and uh, what we call cognitive behavior interventions with them. Um, uh, but that picture is a, uh, a social marketing platform. So they designed, one of the things they were very concerned about was imaging and the different images that was presented about them in their community, that uh, they weren't all gang-banging thugs uh, as some people uh, try to portray. And so they wanted to rebrand themselves in a sense. And so they created and designed this billboard, set up the plan for it. And if you were uh, near Chicago and Pulaski, which is a street on the west side, a corner on the west side, you would have seen this billboard up there, um, as well as they engaged in you know, other things like participatory action research. So over an 18-month time period, um, as many of the young people were involved in the criminal justice system, we only had one person who actually reoffended. 
Um, got arrested again during that process. Um, and uh, we found it to be a successful program. Um, I bring up that one person um, because even uh, uh, his story, I think, is, is very valuable. He was a young man who uh, uh, was very bright. Uh, we, we developed a, a participatory action research project. I'm sure some of you know what that is, where we taught those young people research methods and uh, engage them in constructing a research question and a research study of the, their design. They were curious, they were actually curious and wanted to know uh, how, you know, which side of the town might be more violent, right? That, that was the south side more violent than the west side? And so they did uh, focus groups and, and uh, conducted surveys around that uh, and even analyzed the data and even presented it at some point. Um, but one of the uh, uh, interesting things happened. Um, at some point, this young man, this particular young man, um, he uh, uh, actually got arrested um, and was sentenced to uh, do a period of time uh, uh, in detention. And um, before he went in, um, he was engaged in the research aspect of things. So we gave him a small stipend uh, as a part of the research team, right? Um, and so. Uh, they were supposed to receive a check as being a part of that team. Um, something happened in the bureaucratic structure of giving stipends through university, and there was a delay on them receiving their payment. As a matter of fact, there was a, a, a three-day delay. Um, but the day they were supposed to pick up the checks, um, it coincided almost with the time that he was supposed to go in. He was supposed to go in and report uh, for detention about two days uh, after the checks were received. And so, uh, so then when they came to pick up the checks, he was notified that he wouldn't receive the check and he broke into tears. And, um, and so, and we were left with, you know, having to explain to this young man, you know, what happened. And so we were like, well, uh, is there anything we can do to help? And he said, no, you don't understand. He said, I know I'm going to detention, but what this program has done is it taught me accountability, it taught me responsibility. And, um, and I believe it's important, you know, for me to, to earn my keep in my household. So I was going to take this check and I was going to pay a light bill um, at my household because they need the money. Um, and that was the one thing that I could contribute, but now I can't do that. Um, and so I'm just, you know, floored by it, right? Uh, needs to say, you know, we were all heartbroken by that incident and issue. And so we did what we needed to do, but I really want to point out just, you know, as we have this narrative often of young people in community, you know, who are heartless and cold and they don't uh, uh, want to take care of responsibility and do all these things. Here's an example. That even the one young man who we did who uh, reoffended, he still was actively engaged in really trying to do something better for himself. Um, and I can tell you story after story uh, about young people like that, 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 we, that we disregard, um, that we write off. Um, and they end up uh, doing, or they are a transformation of young people who do and can do great things. Uh, my better half tells another story. Uh, my wife is a researcher and uh, professor at Loyola University in Chicago, and she was conducting a, a focus group with a group of young men who were um, um, in the eighth grade of, of, of a school, and it was about some of the same context of violence. When she went to conduct the focus group at the school, the teachers uh, were sharing with her, okay, this, you take this young man, this young man, that young man, but you want to be careful about that particular young guy. As a matter of fact, we need to go in the room with you with this young man. My wife was like, no, I got it. And they were like, you sure? We need somebody to protect you, that kind of thing. She said, no, I can, I can handle it. And so she went on to go in the room with this young man who was supposedly a young man who was causing a lot of problems, causing all the issues uh, uh, in, in the school. Um, as she went through the focus group, one of the things she asked about is how they were dealing with stress, how they were coping with some of the stressful issues that they were dealing with in their community, particularly around the violence. And she mentioned about physiological symptoms sometimes of how we deal with stress. And the young man in question uh, talked about, you mean like how I've been biting my nails, right? And he went on to give this wonderful analysis about how he deals with stress, right, and how he deals with violence and, and his ability to cope, you know, around some of these things happen. Now, this was a young man that they didn't want my wife to talk to, right, because they was afraid that his behavior would be so challenging. But um, 
partly because who she is, but ultimately uh, because she gave him a chance to be able to be intelligent, uh, the, the intelligent self that he was. She was, he, she was able to demonstrate, and he was able to demonstrate who he was uh, as a leader within that, that group. So I'm pointing all this out to say that, uh, again, we turn our backs often on young people, uh, but they amaze us if we give them the opportunity and the space to do that work. I might be preaching to the choir in some ways in this, but, I, but because of what I see consistently in the city, I know that um, this kind of attention is rare um, and how we do it. So another intervention we did was Project Mentor. Project Mentor was a health mentoring program. Not gonna spend a lot of time here, but this intervention, we, uh, we set up academic enhancement, one-to-one -one mentoring. Uh, I did it in partnership uh, with uh, Dr. David Dubois, who's done a lot of the, uh, the work uh, evaluating and doing research on the Better Voice Foundation, Better Voice and Better Girls Foundation and their mentoring program. Um, and so we use a lot of uh, what we consider to be evidence-based strategies and practices and design the intervention. It worked fabulous, uh, particularly with those higher risk group. So why am I talking about these interventions? I'm not trying to sell you on my programs per se, because the reality is, is that there are many evidence-based interventions that exist out here. There are many different programs that are doing fabulous work. Uh, and, um, and there's a lot of design that can make a difference. But then why do we still have this, right? Why do we still have the mass shooting that takes place? This is a map that um, was from 2013, um, over a six month time span uh, in Chicago in terms of the number of shootings. Um, and um, it's been consistent probably for the last maybe five years. Uh, maybe with the exception of this year. Um, and as you can see, much of the violence is concentrated uh, towards the south side and the west side. Chicago really doesn't have an east side for those who don't know much about it. Um, the east side is probably the southeast side. But as you can look and see in this particular map, um, it's all over, right? So it's not just concentrated on the south. Maybe one little section of white up there uh, in the map, and that's probably Lincoln Park, which is uh, arguably the wealthiest neighborhood in Chicago, but every place else, you have that. Um, so, so as we designed our intervention and as we looked at Project Mentor, we started thinking about other types of interventions that we were supporting and consulting with. Uh, but these, this other thing was going on too, right? You had the shootings and the young people in Project Mentor, young people in Full Circle, constantly talked about the stress that they were dealing with associated with the shootings. We also had some other stuff going on. In 2012, we had a mass uh, uh, amount of school closing. Some of you may know about this by now, right? That over 50 schools were closed uh, in one swoop uh, in Chicago. It was an unprecedented activity uh, designed to save money, save funds within schools, right? Now, we could, we could make a case uh, that um, it, it did some savings for a while, but we also saw uh, over the last few years that there's been a lot of problems with the follow-up to that, uh, particularly with administrators who've been stealing money. Our superintendent uh, just got indicted, I think, uh, uh, just last year, right? And so, so we've had a pro lot of problems. And so even these mixed messages that go out and the impact on the lives of people around the school closing. Um, and as you can see, they're in the similar neighborhoods. But we also have here, too, uh, some issues associated with housing, right? In some of the larger uh, areas where we have the most foreclosures, um, there are also some of the areas where we have the shootings, right? So, um, and, and which a lot of us know, you know, we see some of the similar indicators, you know, in some of the same spaces. But I argue here that when we often deal with trauma, particularly in my discipline in social work or in the clinical world in mental health, uh, we often regulate it to the interpersonal aspect and we don't look at these larger issues and how they move across the screen, how our people who we work with are impacted you know, by these particular issues. This is actually uh, from this year. So from January 1st, and this is actually, uh, I think I downloaded it yesterday. Um, so as of April 5th, uh, we had 814 shootings, um, which uh, is uh, well ahead of the rate of last year and even the one from uh, 2013. So over a three month time period, uh, about once every two and a half hours, someone gets shot in Chicago. And that's the specter 
you know, of the violence. And as you can see, whereas that maybe in the other maps it wasn't spread as much, um, it's all over the city. And so whether you are downtown, you hear about somebody getting shot, um, in Hyde Park, uh, where the University of Chicago is, uh, a few blocks from President Obama's home, folks get shot, right? Um, and so this is uh, the specter. So within this, um, in, in terms of my work, I've decidedly turned more around the trauma focus, but then also really thinking about capacity. I just want to show you one more intervention that we designed, but let me just touch on this first. So this is just another layer you know, of thinking about some of these issues we deal with. Uh, this was a, uh, comes from a report done by uh, the University of Illinois Chicago and the Great Cities Institute, um, thinking about uh, and looking at jobs and joblessness in the city. And so the, uh, as you can see in the red, uh, those are the places where uh, young people, uh, the most young people are out of work currently uh, between the age of 20 and 24. Uh, right now, uh, black youth, um, there's a 39.5% clip of black youth in uh, uh, Cook County that are currently unemployed compared to 7.9% of white youth, right, and 14.7% of, of, of Latino youth. Um, and so, so here, um, again, we have respective issues happening from housing to schooling to work, right, and we're not even talking about other health crises and, and, and context that lay out the specter of violence. And so um, we are at the place where we can't just have a one-stop approach to it, that we have to, uh, we have to be uh, multifaceted in terms of how we deal with it. Um, currently, uh, Commissioner Richard Boykins uh, in Chicago, uh, in Cook County Commissioner, uh, has proposed a $50 million plan um, that would uh, increase the job support um, because a common thing that you hear a lot of people say is nothing stops a bullet better than a job, right? Um, and, and that's an important mantra. Um, but again, this is what we're dealing with. We designed another intervention called Truth and Trauma, or TNT, and this one, we took some of the uh, evidence-informed strategies that we had looked at around some of the CBT work, but we thought that it's important to take our work now and actually train young people on being, becoming what we call trauma-informed out in the community, out in the world in order to do work, right? And so that had a lot of trauma, trauma recovery components, what we call restorative practice, restorative justice work, life skill work, um, but it was a decidedly leadership and advocacy component. We began the process of looking at these larger spectra of issues out here in terms of how we look at trauma, because they were coming in and they were talking about the issues with the school closings. They were talking about not just the violence and the shooting, but they were talking about the jobs issue. They were talking about the housing issues. And they were saying that nobody's addressing all of them and the stress that they're feeling and experiencing because of that. Um, and so we wanted to be able to not only uh, support that and train, but then also get them out uh, and engaged in some advocacy associated with that work. And, uh, and again, it turned out to be a, a, a dynamic program. Um, of course, we used uh, positive youth development principles within that um, and what we consider to be youth adult partnerships work. But we decided to take, we took what, what I consider to be a trauma-informed lens uh, in our work and what we did and how we did it uh, and um, as they moved into that. So I do want to stop here and talk a little bit about trauma, right, and define it because um, as we go on, um, I think it would be important to, uh, again, have some of this context. So here's a definition from NIMH, National Institute of Mental Health, uh, the experience of an event that is mostly painful or, distress or distressful, which often results in lasting and mental effects, right? Um, and I bring in that key word here, the experience, how we interpret it, how we pull it in, that you can have uh, two people have the same event uh, uh, and experience that same event and have two, two completely different responses, right? I do an exercise sometime uh, where I might have two people stand up in the room and if you look that way, you see one thing and if you look that way, you see another thing uh, and, and you just, you would describe something but you're in the same room. So it's dissimilar as we look at this trauma event, right? So uh, going forward, the traumatic event is one in which a person experiences, witnesses, or is confronted with an actual threatened death, serious injury, threats to physical integrity of self, responses to a traumatic event can include intense fear, helplessness, horror, et cetera, right? And so we know um, 
that uh, uh, we know how the experience of, uh, of, of, of a violent event occurs often in our world, and we know that um, uh, as a result, you know, you can have these different experiences associated with that. Perception, as I mentioned, in terms of experience, becomes a critical part of that. Uh, perception of trauma varies vastly among individuals. It's something that overwhelms our coping capacity, right? And so how we deal with it, how we take in that event, freezes us, if you will, right? Um, and it ends up impacting the entire self, right? Physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. As I mentioned, much of our work uh, in, in terms of in trauma-informed practice and, and in trauma recovery often deals with you know, the interpersonal and individual context. And so we're just beginning to understand you know, what a lot of this means you know, around this, this idea of community violence. Um, um, other impacts of trauma, prolonged exposure to trauma and a repetitive trauma events may cause an individual's natural alarm system to no longer function as it should. And so often um, in these uh, spaces when a person has experienced something, um, if they've experienced and witnessed a gunshot, for example, now when they are in a different environment, if somebody drops a book, suddenly uh, they either overact or again, maybe it's, they become desensitized. But how they respond to that changes and transforms. Um, uh, often, um, those emotional, physical responses to stress change and transform in terms of how we operate. Uh, people become emotional numb, um, or they have psychological avoidance of issues or triggers that often uh, may remind them of that particular event. Uh, it also impacts how a person might see safety, uh, how, might, how they might have a sense of safety in terms of how they operate, and naturally diminishes their trust uh, in others. Um, in this talk, I am focusing a little bit more on the spectrum of community violence, right? But not to disregard uh, some of the other things that we see that are often gendered violence as well as some of the things that happen with children in our world. Um, uh, other things that we uh, experience as an impact of trauma and injury. Uh, sometimes people have difficulty accessing their emotions. Uh, the idea of healing becomes hard to actually internalize. Um, so uh, it's hard to really take it in and, and move into that process of recovery. Um, and what we do know and recognize is that often uh, when people experience a traumatic events, they lose their voice, right? Uh, they can't talk about it, but they also have a, a, a difficulty even expressing about other issues uh, and, and things they're dealing with. Um, so we often refer to the three E's associated with trauma. Uh, the three E's being the actual event, um, what happens, right? The experience of the event, again, how I'm taking in that particular event, and then the effects of the event, right? Um, and so, again, how this situation happens, I was in a car, the car crashed, um, uh, I thought my life was over, I thought I got a second chance at life in terms of my experience, but then um, now how I deal with that, it, uh, in terms of the ongoing effects, whether those effects are short term or long term. You know, every time I see a similar car, um, my hands get sweaty, right? Um, it, it gets real intense for me. Uh, so um, trauma recovery largely focuses on whether short term or long term, you know, how we recover from that. Um, some of you may be familiar with the ACES study, the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study, uh, which was a study that looked at um, 17,000 participants longitudinally over a long period of time. And uh, what they saw, what we knew was that um, an adverse childhood experience could impact people um, you know, down the road, right? So something happens, you witness some violence in the household, uh, somebody uh, 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 has an addiction problem in the household, uh, there's an abandonment or uh, neglect issue in the household, and then how a person grows up um, we knew that there might be some impact to that. We just didn't know how, how much, right? How much it was and how many people might be exposed to uh, some form of violence in terms of their work. And so uh, this study really opened the door to really begin the process of looking and seeing how traumatic experiences are, are more prevalent. This is the basic framework and conceptual framework around ACES um, that um, starts with, uh, as you can see at the bottom, uh, these adverse childhood experiences and how 
uh, they might disrupt what we call neurodevelopment. Um, what uh, we've been able to see over the last 20, 30 years is just how traumatic events impact the brain, right? And ultimately how that ends up impacting uh, how we operate and the choices that we make and even recovery to some degree. Um, and from that, uh, we have social, emotional, and cognitive impairment that also may lead to some of these other things in life from disease, disability, other social problems, uh, or other uh, what we can saw, consider to be risk behaviors, and that ultimately lead, uh, leads to early death. So those participants within that study um, demonstrated, particularly if they had a, a certain score, right, um, with two or more uh, 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 findings on there, that uh, it may lead to a particular early death. Um, so what we know about trauma recovery um, is that it's important to have what we consider to be a reliable support system, friends and family around, access to safe and stable housing, and then of course, timely and appropriate care from those people on the front line. And that um, if those are in place at the beginning and ongoing, that people have a better chance of recovering from uh, these uh, particular issues as they uh, take place. Um, so I thought it'd be important to begin with a little bit of that lens um, as we you know, begin to move because um, as we talk about trauma-informed care, right, um, these three things become very critical. Making sure that the place is safe, making sure that connections are happening, and then also doing what we call managing emotional impulses, particularly for young people or even uh, adults who may have demonstrated some uh, 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 dynamics associated with, with trauma, right? And I would argue those first two become very critical, safety and connections and the relationships we see uh, are, make all the difference. Building community makes all the difference. Um, Trauma-informed care also avoids revictimization, right? And so whereas that we are not, uh, we don't uh, uh, re-traumatize the person uh, in doing the work with them. It appreciates many problem behaviors begin as understandable attempts to cope. So a lot of people who show up who might demonstrate uh, 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 some level of violence might have had some of these uh, dynamics happen to them before that we need to understand. It strives to maximize choices for the survivor and control of the healing process. So we think about how a person may heal um, and how we support that healing and that um, it is, is important to engage uh, that person in some leadership of, uh, associated with that and not as a continued victim. Um, it seeks to be culturally competent. We think about what a trauma uh, uh, recovery plan might look like for uh, a military v veteran versus uh, a person of color versus somebody who's male versus somebody who's female, a man or a woman. Um, and also understands each survivor in the context of his or her life experiences, right, and what all those mean. And so that's where I, I, I want to um, transition here, you know, back to some of the, the themes of our conversation. Um, because what does all this mean in the spectrum of this idea of, again, valuing black life, right, in community? Uh, what does all these things mean when we, when we bring in some of these issues of of how we see what happens with police brutality, but also what we see in the ongoing community. Um, I had an interesting uh, ride with uh, um, um, the um, uh, car company that uh, brought me uh, to the airport in Chicago. There was a, uh, a young man driving and um, driving me to the airport. And I've been just loosely asking people uh, lately you know, what do they think about some of the issues in, uh, with police, right? What do they think about some of the issues around violence in, in, uh, in the community? What about the spike in violence, right? And so I asked them, why do you think uh, there's so many more shootings this year than last year? And, you know, he talked about, you know, I think, um, you know, we're still dealing with some of the drugs issues, uh, some of the neighborhood conflicts. He talked a little bit about that. Um, and he talked about them very matter-of-factly. Um, you know, that these things are happening. Uh, we need to have a deeper understanding addressing, you know, what some of the different substances people are using in the community. So we talked a lot about a lot of those kind of things. And then I said, well, the police said, right, that it's the ACLU effect, right? And I don't know if y'all heard about this before. 
But the police have said this idea that because the ACLU is paying more attention to how they operate, uh, the reinforcement of body cameras, the filling out more reports once they stop people, they stop stopping people, basically, right? And so I told him that that's what they say. And he just rolled his eyes, right, and said, what? You know, like, oh, no. And then he went into a story. He said, listen, man, just a couple of years ago, um, I was uh, walking down the street. I had had a warrant because I lost, I lost my job and I ended up writing a bad check. And I got arrested for it, but they dropped the charges. And so I'm walking down the street. Across the street from me, there are people standing on the stoop selling drugs, right? I see this. So I'm headed to my house, which is maybe a half a block down. The police roll up on me and ask me where I'm going. I say, I'm going home. They asked to see my ID. I gave it to them. They pull up my ID and they see the warrant. And I tell them, the warrant is for a couple of years ago, right? And so, uh, and, and mind you, while he's talking this, his, he's becoming very elevated. Uh, you know, he's starting to talk louder. I'm watching the road because now he's driving a little bit different. Um, and he, he says, well, his mother came out the house to ask what the question, you know, what's going on. And the police yelled at his mother, told her to get back in the house. He yelled at them and said, that's my mother. Why would you disrespect her? She's just trying to help, right? Of course, they threw him in the, in the car and they took him down and they, uh, they booked him, you know, for the, the, the warrant. But when they came up on the system, it found out that it was, it, they had been processed for a dismissal. They still kept him um, uh, and shipped him to the county jail, where he spent the next three weeks in the county jail, right, until finally they let him out, right? And so by this time, he was so elevated and angry as he was talking, right? Um, and I would argue that that's a typical response both of those responses, that when you ask someone about the violence, right, they have a lot of different uh, uh, theories on it, um, but you also talk about the police, right, it becomes a very passion plea, right? So it's a both end experience that people are dealing with in the community, you know, around these issues. It's the, the spectrum of the institutions and the failure of the institutions and it's also some of these things that have happened. So I argue that you almost can't separate them in our conversation as we begin to have and do this work. So when we look at the things that have happened around Trayvon and Oscar Grant, you know, Rakia Boyd and Sandra Bland, uh, Laquan McDonald, and I can keep going on and on, right? Uh, and again, these are very visible media. I would argue that these things are happening almost every day in the community and people are experiencing that but we haven't been listening. Our inherent human rights work, I believe, within the context of this larger conversation is our ability to, to bring in that voice and that ability to listen and hear and to lift it out. Our channel here, uh, Janella Dance, a uh, sociologist from the East Coast, who talks about this idea and policy of either seeing things big or seeing things small, is that often as policymakers, we see things small, we see the numbers, we see the analysis, and that's important work. But we also have to invite and engage the ability to be able to see things big. Uh, in other words, lift up the stories and listen to the stories and validate the stories uh, that we hear out there. Whether he was completely telling the truth or fabricating a piece of his story, the emotions were very real, right? And his perception, again, was very real in how he was experiencing, right? So I would argue that we need, a, again, a trauma-informed response. So we couch any conversation that we have around trauma, I believe, in this piece. And we also have to couch it in uh, what I call historical trauma and thinking about those and structural trauma and structural violence and how it operates. And if we do that, we also have to couch it in resistance. Um, so here's a definition uh, by Gatung that uh, many people are familiar with from uh, a while ago. He said, denotes a form of violence which corresponds with the systemic, uh, systematic ways in which a given social structure, a social institution kills people slowly by preventing them from meeting their basic needs, right? Um, almost a slow onslaught, if you will, right? Guidelines, laws, and practices driven by institutions that harm communities of color. And I pose these as more questions, right? What might be happening in Flint, right? Um, Ferguson, Missouri. I don't know if anybody's seen the uh, Department of Justice report 
uh, that was done about Ferguson and what was happening in that area. Uh, but if you haven't seen it, I really recommend just going to take a look at it. You can access it online. I think they got a book copy of it. But I think it's one of the more uh, comprehensive reports um, uh, uh, done about a particular police department and uh, a city um, looking at the spectra of, of how the police were operating. And I think it gives one of the best uh, analysis of this systemic racism that may have been happening in this city from both those bigger issues in terms of what was happening in leadership all the way to what was happening in small, which prompted the larger Missouri panel you know, to really begin the process and ultimately the president's uh, response around being able to deal with. We know the issues that are happening in Chicago Police Department as well as in our schools. So, so we can make the case that, that, that this definition could apply to some of these. I also bring in Paul Farmer's definition. I know it's a lot of words up there, but I'm gonna trouble it a bit. Uh, because I think it's very important. Uh, Paul Farmer, who some of you may know uh, about, uh, who does um, medical anthropology work, medical work in Haiti and different parts of Africa, uh, who's often brought up this issue about structural violence and how it operates and the human rights question associated with that. So he says that structural violence is one way of describing social arrangements that put individuals and populations in harm's way. The arrangements are structural because they are embedded in the political, and economic organizations of our social world. They are violent because they cause injury to people. Neither culture nor per individual will is at fault. Rather, historically given and often economically driven processes and forces conspire to constrain individual agency. Structural violence is visited upon those, all those whose social status denies them access to the fruits of scientific and social progress. So when we see what we saw earlier, the schools issues, the housing issues, the educational, I mean, and the, and the jobs pieces, right? Along with this larger community violence pieces, right? We can see elements of what uh, 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 Brother F Farmer has, has positioned, uh, which is largely a public health response, right? And so those of you know, uh, 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 who are thinking about and do community violence work and, and, and know about uh, the literature right now is that we are looking at violence as a public health piece. Um, um, even Gary Slutkin, who is the, uh, uh, the director and founder of, of Cure Violence, what we know to be ceasefire, right? And some of you saw the Interrupters movie and things like that, um, says we should even just take the public out of it and just say health, right? Uh, because it's a very large spectrum. Um, and uh, Slutkin and I have a, had a conversation about some of this, and we are decidedly looking at that. So when we say resistance, right? and how people have resisted in, in, in historical pieces. I want to go back in Chicago to 1919. Um, and some of you may know about the race riots of 1919. Just a quick story. Um, a young man um, decided in a segregated all-white beach, 31st Street Beach, uh, wanted to go for a swim. And when he went out for the swim, of course, the whites opposed. They attacked him, killed him, and a, a riot ensued. Um, and so, again, we can't look at the spectrum of community violence in our city without being able to look at this historical context, you know, and as well, again, how folks have resisted, particularly black people in this case, have resisted, right? Um, in the 1950s and 60s, the movement to address segregation was met with white terror and white violence. Again. Another example of how we've seen this uh, uh, spectrum of violence persist and, and, and happen in our communities in response to just access and thinking about just rights, right? The swimming incident was an issue of rights, right? The, the, not necessarily thinking about privilege, right? But in a sense of rights. And rights invites us to the conversation of equity and access, how I have the ability to be able to access uh, certain things. Not that I want another group to not have it, but how do we access it, right? Um, and so the housing issue became another piece around that. Uh, uh, Lorraine Hansberry, when she wrote Raisin in the Sun, really troubled this issue, you know, from the 50s and, and the 60s around the housing spectrum, right? And certainly we can argue, and looking at Walter Lee Younger and even that family's response, that that was traumatic for them to experience it. I invite you to go back and either read the play or Watch the film if you, if you have an opportunity. Uh, Natalie Moore, in her new book, 
uh, Southside, which I highly recommend you check out, uh, uh, really talks about this issue of segregation. And uh, she references the Hansberry story, as well as about um, how segregation plays into this larger spectrum you know, of the city. Um, King, in 1965 and 66, came to Chicago to, to address uh, this specter, right, of, of, of violence around the segregation, right? And of course, was met with violence. In Marquette Park, this is a scene from Marquette Park, uh, where he had just had a rock thrown at his head. Um, and making a stance and, and offering uh, that you know, something needed to be different and, and pushing the conversation around equity. So I would argue that Chicago has been met with this historical violence you know, and, and this structural violence in a very, very real way for some particular uh, time. I bring up another person, uh, uh, Fred Hampton, who some of you know about, who was the, uh, arguably the leader of the Black Panther, Panther Party in Chicago. Uh, and was very active in a people's movement to begin the process of address it. For those who don't know, Fred Hampton was killed um, by police in his apartment. Um, there was a, a raid uh, set up uh, in part by the FBI and the police uh, to raid Fred Hampton, and they uh, entered his apartment, uh, shot. Uh, they, this, it was one shot that came out of the apartment. There was 92 that went in, right? Uh, and that's where Fred Hampton uh, uh, was killed. And so I say, that, I say all of this to say that, you know, our memory isn't that short. And so people in Chicago remember these things, and we hear stories about these things. We hear about the continued uh, issues of, you know, with the police, right? And so within that, it fractures the very trust that happens. The current, uh, uh, we just, uh, uh, Rahm Emanuel just named a new uh, 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 police superintendent uh, just last week, and that's a whole nother set of controversy associated with that. Uh, but the first thing he said is that we need to focus on one word, trust, and reestablishing that within the context of our work, which, which becomes very critical. I was in a, a peace circle. Some of you may know about the uh, peace circle or restorative justice work um, with some police uh, a, a few months ago. Actually, the, uh, the weekend before the Laquan McDonald uh, video was released. Um, I had the uh, privilege of being in the circle, right? And so it was one of those, those spaces created where the police came together with some young people and we were talking about you know, some of these issues that we're dealing with community. And um, they had a very worried look on the face and I asked them what was that about? And they said, well, we just got a phone call just a few minutes before we walked in the circle that the video's coming out. And everybody's concerned about the reaction, how people are going to react associated with that particular video. And so I asked, I said, well, what do you think is going to happen? And, you know, did you all see the video? Have you heard about it? And they said, yeah, we've heard about it. We heard it was pretty ugly. And, you know, they went on to talk about, you know, kind of on the defense a little bit um, uh, about how uh, there were bad cops and, you know, uh, they hurt the good cops. And they kind of went into that discourse and dialogue. And I was like, yeah, that's good. And, you know, I said, and I offered what, you know, King, quote, Nitschke said, you know, what the, the ev greatest evil in the world is not done by bad people. It's by good people who see evil and they do nothing about it, right? So what do you say about these issues that you see? And they offered, well, it's complicated because, you know, this happens and these people might uh, get mad. And so this whole blue code uh, that operates, uh, blue code of silence, um, uh, permeates and nothing gets resolved, right? Uh, and so I challenged them at that point that maybe what we need is, you know, a new form of speaking out about these issues. But um, as of right now, they, I still haven't heard anybody from the police department say anything, right, around these issues. So it persists. We saw what happened after Laquan. Um, the video came out. Uh, we saw what happened. Okay. We saw what happened after that. Um, that. Um, we had a, a strong level of, of resistance that came out in community uh, uh, in Chicago on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, um, uh, protesters marched down town on the, what we call the Gold Coast in Chicago, which is a prime shopping location, and basically shut everything down on that particular day. 
um, and, uh, uh, as, and it was a transformational moment in the city, but I also think a, uh, a strong uh, response to the traumatic grief that many people experience associated with the Khan's uh, uh, death, uh, Laquan's death. Um, I thought this was a very interesting picture, right? The one from 1919 and the one from 2015, right? We still haven't faced off with the police, right? So many years later, uh, some of these things are, are still happening. Uh, so, so what do we do and how do we operate and how do we bring all of this stuff together? One of my beliefs is that within the context of restorative justice work, um, we are able to frame this, bring this conversation together uh, in a very real way. Um, uh, some of you may know a little bit about restorative justice. Uh, that movement uh, in Chicago um, has largely come out of some of the larger movements of both, uh, looking at uh, criminal justice reform here, but then also abroad in places like South Africa in some ways, um, and its strengths and also its challenges, right? Um, but as a response, a defiant response to criminal justice, um, what we have in, uh, often is a very real response to criminal justice that we call street justice in a lot of ways, right? People take justice in their own hands when they don't trust the institutions of upholding what they're supposed to uphold, right? You're not uphold, uphold your deal. I can't trust that you're gonna follow through in this particular way in a good way, so thus we make a response. And so how do we build that within the practice of our work and how do we frame that? Um, what many of us, uh, there's a lot of uh, a big moving around the circle keepers, peacekeeping circles, things like that. But I argue that we have to move again beyond the interpersonal level to deal with these issues on an organizational level. Um, part of our challenge is that I mentioned the Cook County's bill, uh, I've worked with the city, worked with some other folks, that many of these institutions aren't talking with each other, right? And so we need a greater degree of uh, accountability and transparency between institutions uh, and some restorative practices, if you will, you know, in that way. Uh, one way we've been going about doing this um, is, uh, this is an initiative through some of my colleagues at DePaul University's Egan Urban Center where they've been training and working with police as well as community organizations and neighbors um, about coming together to really talk about and deal with and come up with some new uh, practices uh, from and partly using uh, what we consider to be an asset-based community development framework uh, but ultimately in a restorative way with a restorative lens of partnership development you know around the work uh, so engaging in training of police citizens uh, and organizations to really build capacity and community uh, to be able to deal with another one um, I think Yazir mentioned this earlier uh, we've been working on what we call this multi-faith veterans project and we were funded largely in response to the some uh, 22 veteran suicides a day uh, that that are occurring um, you know throughout our country and maybe even throughout the globe uh, and in other in order to build capacity uh, in community around this now uh, many believe that uh, many of our soldiers are coming back you know with a lot of uh, war wounds, if you will, not physically, but also emotionally and mentally as well. Uh, but many of them are falling through the cracks. We have a large amount of homeless population. Uh, our federal government has done a lot to respond to that, but we still have it. Uh, and so we partner with some of those institutions, the VA, vet centers, and community to really be able to build that, uh, that, that peace. Um, so why am I mentioning this? Why am I talking about all of this stuff? Um, so our lens is in looking at this idea of moral injury. If you haven't heard it before, uh, this is the definition, disruption in an individual's confidence and expectations about his or her own moral behavior or others' capacity to behave in a just and ethical manner. Um, so largely, you know, associated with veterans or people in the military, right? I go out and I'm in war and I do something against my moral ethic and I come back and I can't deal with it. And I'm struggling with dealing with it. And as a consequence, um, um, you know, I, I, I basically eat myself alive, right, um, and, and, and self-destruct. Um, you know, similar to PTSD, but different, right? Whereas PTSD is a traumatic response, it, you know, I reference this idea of trauma and how we respond to it. Um, it's looked at a, a more of a, de a depressive uh, lens, right? The sorrow, grief, regret, shame, alienation, um, and that there's some, some, some of both in, in terms of the work. 
well, why is it relevant here? Why is it relevant for our work? Because what a lot of people believe, including our funders, right, uh, the McCormick Foundation in Chicago, and the larger national conversation is that it, it, it gets dealt with in community, that you can't deal with this issue in isolation. And although I have a lot of problems about our military industrial complex and how it operates uh, and how it runs, you know, the other part of that is that often uh, because of some of the things that happen in the context of war, we begin to see, you know, different ways of understanding, you know, human behavior. So, the, the, so PTSD and how we think about trauma came from, you know, how we were dealing with uh, uh, survivors of war 50, 60 years ago. So I argue here this lens of moral injury that is worth taking a look at in the context of how injury happens in community. Patricia Williams talked about this idea of spirit injury, right? That when you experience something, uh, you know, based on discrimination, based on an othering or an objectification, right? That it causes an injury to the soul and to the spirit. And so that on some level, you know, how we engage and transform society has to be around, again, that human rights conversation. Because ultimately, when we move the conversation from objectification to, to subject, to other as subject, to other as person and human being, then we begin the process of, of, of having that transformational lens. And so I argue that our investment has to be in capacity development in community, you know, around the services that are exist in terms of social service, but also an engagement of training and support, um, the development of advocacy, as well as development of increasing our infrastructure and community to be able to address uh, these particular issues. I think my time is up, but I do want to offer this one last quote. This was a quote uh, from King, uh, Martin Luther uh, King Jr. Uh, in, I believe, 1967 or 8, uh, but he was uh, speaking to the American Psychological Association, and he quote Victor Hugo. He said, if a soul is left in the darkness, sins would be committed. The guilty one is not he who commits the sin, but he who causes the darkness, right? And so as we begin to look at and think about, again, this response to violence and response into community, you know, I invite us to begin the process of looking at not just those who are those perpetrators, whether those perpetrators be uh, the individuals who commit homicides, who might be part of street organizations, or the police, but we began to think about those institutions and how we push those institutions in our society. Thank you very much. Right. Thank you, Troy. We don't have uh, much time, and when Troy said his time was up, it was. But I think some of the points that he was making at the time, I decided to let go because I think they're important for us to discuss. I'm going to open up the floor. If you want to make any comments on what Troy has said, especially for me, uh, the two points that stood out, uh, and I would hope that we will continue this conversation later, uh, even when Troy has left us, uh, on small moments when we show um, and focus our lens on some of the more simple things when it uh, concerns itself with violence. Just the very things that oftentimes it's easily taken for granted, but once we show, uh, once we take a care and a concern at that point, uh, much change can happen. The simple things um, when one human is just open the space to speak, yeah? and we can hear the pain that lives inside of those words that's textured into its sound, uh, that finds itself uh, lost in the bigger picture. So I'm going to open it up now. There's a mic. Try, try not to just ask questions. If you want to make, make a comment, because there's not a lot of time, respond, uh, and, I'll, and if you want to just ask a question, do so. Yeah, I think there's mics. Is there mics around? So if anybody wants to make a comment in response or ask a question, please feel free to do so. about restorative justice and its restorative justice, the opportunities for that, and whether you think it has much promise? Sure. I'm going to take, is it OK with you if I allow two more questions, given the time? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. OK, so let's, uh, you've marked that. If there's any more, does anybody else want to ask a question? Sometimes these questions can be engaged with simultaneously. Um, yes, uh, I really like, enjoyed your, your talk, and I think it was very good in outlining some of the troubles 
me being from Chicago, have a harder time uh, explaining to a broader audience. But we're talking in a room of people that at least are interested in public policy or know of public policy. Can you better address methods to, uh, to communicate some of the messages in your slides to people who aren't in these rooms, people that in their daily lives don't have access to this information and may not be concerned with it or somewhat apathetic to it or may not know that they're apathetic to it? Thank you. Anything else? Should I go ahead? I just want to write those down. That's right. So I wouldn't forget. Um, ready? All right. Um, yeah, so um, first, just thinking about the restorative justice question. So, and I think it wraps into both of those, right? Uh, both questions. Um, when I think about the, the word restorative, is the big word there for me, right? And then, of course, justice, right? Um, and uh, restoring something, right? Um, and this idea of restoration means I am bringing back something, I am pulling back something, right? Um, and uh, I think, in a lot of ways, it's voice, right? It's voice of victim, it's voice of even perpetrator to some degree. Um, it's bringing the human. Uh, back into uh, 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 this element, right? And even as we think about the, the term justice, right, and how it operates, you know, there's a level of equity, fairness inherent, you know, within, you know, that meaning. Um, I think that's what's been absent often in, in terms of, of, of uh, when we talk about these things that happen in communities. So the possibilities, I believe, are endless in terms of engaging in that framework around restorative justice, how it's implemented, I think, is harder. Uh, we started doing community panels for youth back in the late 90s in Chicago, where um, as a point of diversion, a young person would get an opportunity to do uh, something else as opposed to uh, receive punitive practice. And it went so-so, right? I even had one experience where I heard some person, no, just lock me up, right? Uh, versus then, you know, going through this process of but when I see it work, you know, it, it has tremendous possibilities and opportunity because it brings out this trauma-informed lens and it brings out this other narrative voice within it. So, and people uh, no longer get silenced, they no longer get marginalized, and that everybody gets a process, uh, a, a challenge and a chance to be heard, uh, and then a new understanding and a new way of being gets offered. Um, in some of the circles and some of the places I have opportunity to sit in, I don't often see and hear those voices, right? Those people who are greatly impacted. That young man who I was in the uh, cab with, you know, I don't, I don't hear, I don't see him at those meetings, right? And, and, and it's understandably so, because that languaging sometimes is too distant, right? Um, and even when that person comes, because his language might not match in some of the language and the discourse that we are comfortable engaging with, uh, we don't want to hear it, right? Uh, and so he or she gets shut out of that conversation. And so part of our work, and I mentioned that training lens, right, is in training, is in educating, is in bringing some of these more complex issues down on the ground, you know, to everyday conversation. Uh, I believe that that young man hadn't been asked both of those questions at the same time, right? In other words, this issue about you know, how he's experiencing violence, right? First of all, I doubt that uh, he's had an opportunity to engage with someone like myself. He may have, but the reality is uh, that's not always accessible, right? Um, people from the ivory tower don't always go down to the hood. You don't have these conversations, nor when we do, we don't often uh, bring it again in a language and a framework that they can engage in. But they have critical analysis, right? And they have understanding. It's just a different languaging. And so knowing that, um, as a, a friend of mine said, it's my obligation you know, to be able to bring that information to folks you know, without having, uh, uh, in, in a way, that lets them know that I haven't left them, right, in a sense, you know, without losing my identity you know, in that process, if this makes sense. Um, and so that. When we, are, when we have those conversations at the table, we are able to break down these concepts. I sat in the classroom, I remember way back 25 years ago at the University of Chicago, 
And I was a young man from, you know, 47th Street. And as I was sitting in the classroom, some of the concepts that first the professor was talking about, I was like, what is he saying, right? And everybody was having this conversation. And then I asked the professor, well, are you really talking about X, Y, and Z? And he said, yes. And I realized then it's smoke and mirrors, right? Is that that's part of the, uh, uh, to borrow from uh, uh, Brodeau, right, around cultural capital, right? You know, I didn't have the lexicon at the time, you know, to engage, but then it was just a matter of flipping the switch to be able to transform that piece. And so I think that's across the board. I see it happen again and again and again. I've, I hadn't seen uh, many people engage street, or, uh, street, uh, street involved youth in participatory action research, teaching them research methods. My guess is because nobody thought they could handle it. Right? But once we broke down the processes, they did a lot better than some of those folks who were highly trained right? you know, in doing that. Um, uh, because they had a different nuance and understanding about, and they had been thinking about a lot of these issues you know, in a very real way. So I hope that answered some of your question. Yeah. Yeah. So there's, we have a couple of more minutes. If there's anybody else that wants to add a comment or, make a, you know, or ask a question. Thank you. From what I've heard, you walked us through a path. Um, so this is part comment, part question. Um, and maybe a chance for you to reflect for a moment longer on uh, what I've heard and what you've shown us. Um, but you've walked us through historical violence into historical trauma, structural trauma, structural violence, resistance, and then into street criminal restorative and transformative justice in a space, that space that is very tenuous between resistance and justice. Um, what message would you want those of us here in the room to take as we try to live our lives in that space? Anybody else? I know that was a very complicated spatial question. <laughs> um, but we'll take one more. Mm -hmm. To kind of um, go off that, are there any programs that you know where specifically white people are working with other white people on addressing our own history? I mean, obviously we have all the opportunity in the world to look at things, but restorative justice practices where people are kind of discussing, you know, what it means to be white and what our legacy is and, you know, doing work together around that. Hmm. Good question. Well, um, I'll go backwards, right? Uh, there is an organization in Chicago that I think that they're, they're creating that space. Um, I'll can connect with uh, Professor Henry and maybe get it to you or I'll give you my email. Um, uh, but I think the spaces are few and far between. Um, and in part because there is the, uh, you know, the question around, can I learn as white about these issues with just us, right, with just whites? Uh, do I need a black person in the room or somebody of color, you know, in order to engage that? And I, I think, no, you know, I think you, you know, you, you're right to think about, you know, how that happens and how that formulates. Um, but I think those spaces can be created anywhere, right? Um, I, I know folks who, you know, just started it through different conversations. We're going to do four calls. We're going to discuss. Actually, I know a group right now, the discussion of uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, right, uh, Between Two Worlds, where they meet uh, every two weeks uh, on the phone, you know, and just have that conversation around it. And now they're reading, I think, Just Mercy, right, by Brian Stevenson. So, you know, those kinds of people, and then thinking about what those things mean in, you know, uh, in terms of the actual work, in terms of the policy platform, in terms of the programs, right, and in terms of pushing that. So I think it's possible, and I think it's important, uh, because um, in those spaces, I think there is permission to make greater mistakes, right, greater errors in terms of thinking, to ask deeper questions, you know, as long as there is that spectrum of analysis, right, around, you know, some of this historical white supremacy and kind of dismantling that. And, and so part of my work has been in some ways around men, right, uh, working around uh, gender equity 
and, and, and dealing with men, you know, where they feel like I can say some of these off the wall things, but they're going to get challenged. But, you know, we educate in order to be able to be in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, in a space across gender, you know, to have some very real conversation, you know, uh, in that way. So I think it's very critical, you know, to make that happen. So if I could leave you with something, you know, about this piece, this, this was, uh, this idea is to begin the process of having that deeper conversation about who we aren't listening to, you know, and, and uh, as opposed to learning about who aren't we learning from. Right. And, and if we aren't learning from, then, you know, what's the block and the barrier between that? And I think that cuts across race, class and gender, uh, because certainly I could make a case that even amongst class. Right. We often silence, you know, these other voices that come up through uh, to remind us and, and let us know about suffering, you know, about uh, choice, you know, and about uh, even uh, resistance and resilience. Right. Um, and so, uh, so and, and, I, and I think within that, the invitation is then to bring that voice to the table in a very active way. Um, at the point of decision, at the point of policy decision, at the point of funding, right? Um, and um, if anything, and I, and I revert back to Paul Farmer's work, right? That that uh, farmer um, is very active, right, in making sure, you know, that he is bringing a diverse set of voices to that table in that conversation, but also in that training and that engagement, uh, lifting up people and supporting people into leadership positions, and um, and so that's the other question that I would offer, or you know, is, is to think about that when we find ourselves in leadership positions, right. Um, is it is it with those who we are most comfortable with, you know, or those who are going to do the great work, right? And that maybe the idea is to is to figure out how to bring those people who are going to do the great work to the table, you know, even if it's going to make me a little uncomfortable at times, right? Um, if we have the same ethical mandate, if we have the same uh, communicative sense, you know, uh, and and same love, and I think we too often sell sell each other short. We sell organizations short. And we sell uh, people. So part of the reason I, I mentioned the whole thing about some of the government institutions aren't talking is because people don't like each other, right? And there's history there, and they haven't dealt with their own trauma around that, and they don't go into their own restorative pieces associated with that. And so therefore, uh, it gets very fractured. And you have one person spending a million dollars on this, and another person spending a million dollars on that. And they're the same types of program, and then they compete, and then they give it to the same institutions over and over again because they're not bringing that other voice to that particular table, right? Um, so watch the voices that you bring to the table. Right. That would be it. Um, I don't know if, there, if there's any comment that's really burning because we've we out of institutional time, because when we play Michigan time, we only lose 10 minutes, we never gain 10 minutes. So I'm always, you know, so if there's anybody that's got something burning, show me your hand and we'll consider it. If not, I'm gonna conclude now, because I know we have strong schedules, but I wanna say one thing in conclusion, before I thank uh, Professor Harden, um, is that, you know, uh, this is a beginning um, and a contribution and a part of uh, the conversation, a conversation, not only uh, in the United States, but across the world that many responsible intellectuals are having and hopefully more will have. Um, many leaders, uh, especially in this, the policy world, uh, need to have. And tomorrow evening we will continue it here. Uh, we will be having a conversation that won't be, it'll be less uh, um, lecture form and more conversational. So if any of you uh, are inspired to deal with some, of the, to engage some of these issues more deeply, especially the question of spirit injury, which uh, I was hoping to ask Pr Professor Harden to address more, but the, the, the nexus, the, the inter, the space between large system and everyday, everyday breath, really, what it means to walk on the pavement of, in, in, you know, uh, from here, uh, to the union or from here to the corner of liberty and what it means and how it means as, 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 as different experience for each and every person depending on how 
we are and you are apprehended um, socio-culturally, socio-structurally, and socio-institutionally inside of this larger system that globalizes us all as human beings. So thank you, uh, Professor Haden, for making the trip out here from Chicago and for talking so softly on this issue uh, and kindly and caringly on this issue. Uh, and I, I'm looking forward to continuing this conversation and I hope some of the questions that you ask will be engaged more thoroughly. And I also, in conclusion, wish to, wish to stay that the challenge restoratively in holding uh, such conversations, such dialogic possibility is always already continuous. Yeah. There is, uh, those of us who choose to do so, choose. Do it as we can. What is important is that it needs to be had and it needs to, con it, it, to be spoken. So I want to acknowledge all of those uh, students here who in their own work, in their own lives, are already continuing to have these conversations. And there are many, I can't mention you. I could, it's probably half this class right now, as far as I know. Some, half of you I don't know. Uh, so the other half that I know, know. I know that you are having these conversations in different ways in the spaces that you occupy in the gray uh, of tomorrow. Yeah? We, uh, in the gray of today, tomorrow might appear uh, if I want to continue playing with Victor Hugo. Um, so thank you, and thank you all for coming and taking this time of your schedule, and I hope that you will think about some of the issues made here and continue the conversation with yourselves, your families, in this community at the Ford School and beyond. Thank you. Thank you.